stand together and worship. It's so good to be here this morning with you. I will sing of your goodness. I will sing of your love. Though the seasons come quickly, you will always be enough. Though the night may get darker, though the way shout a praise church he's good amen you all may be seated welcome to arroyo church everybody so good to see you on this great summer morning where it's already like 90 degrees outside it's amazing uh, but 
You know, here at Arroyo Church, we're all about knowing and showing the love of Jesus in the Bay Area and beyond. And I just hope and pray that everybody here would have a genuine experience with Jesus' love and be able to show that love to people in their lives this week as we go from our time today when everything's all said and done. Uh, but before con I continue, we continue together in our time of worship today, we're going to have a few more songs before the message. I just want to let you know one quick announcement of something that's actually happening today. Uh, we have our Connect class right after our worship uh, service is over. And so if you've never taken the Connect class before, I highly encourage you uh, to attend. It's a great time uh, to not just learn more about like the church and like our mission and our values and beliefs and all those good things, but really what is really awesome about the class is you get to learn more about where you're at spiritually and the next steps that God might want you to take, and you learn more about the gifts that God has given you and how you could use them in this world and in the church. So if you're new to the church, this is a great uh, first step for you. And if you haven't taken the class yet, uh, I really encourage you to do it. So again, it's right after the worship service and it's at Paxi's Pizza. So you get free pizza. And uh, it's if you don't know where Paxi, Paxi's Pizza is, it's just right next to the Starbucks at the uh, shopping center that's like right, at, right across from this one. So hope to see you there if you've never taken it before. Uh, and then as always, if you would like to give to Arroyo Church so that our mission of knowing and showing the love of Jesus can continue to move forward, you can give online on our website at arroyochurch.com slash give. And we also have an offering box here in this room. But let me pray for us and uh, we'll get into a few more songs of worship before today's message. Jesus, we do thank you uh, that you are good and that you've always been good and you'll always be good. So Lord, in these moments... Lord, help us to become more aware of your goodness, of your greatness, of your love, of your grace, of your truth. And Lord, from that place would, be, would we be transformed into people that know you more deeply. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together and continue to worship. This morning we just fix our hearts and our minds on Jesus. He's at the right hand of the Father right now. And as we praise his name, as we worship him, we realize that the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So his presence is active, it's alive, and it's here when we praise him. So we just sing together and we steady our hearts.
so grateful to be in this place with you. We just say today that you're worthy, that you're holy, you're worthy of all the honor, all the glory, all the attention that we can give you. So we honor you today, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. And all God's people said, amen. Your actions are always a result of your thoughts. In other words, you're living stems from your thinking. If your actions are the fruit, then that means your thoughts, if your actions are the fruit, then that means your, your thoughts are actually the root that it, it comes from, right? If you have an orange tree and it, it bears orange fruits, well, there's a root supporting it. And without the root, there can be 
no fruit. And it's the same with your actions. It's the same with your thoughts. If you are rooted in negative thinking, you're going to have a negative life. If you're rooted in fearful thinking, you're going to live a fearful life. If you're rooted in lustful thinking or prideful thinking, you're going to live a prideful or lustful life. Whatever your thoughts are, whatever direction your thoughts are trending, that is the direction your life, your actions are going to trend. And you see, here's the problem, is a lot of people want life transformation, but they think it's going to happen on the surface level, not the deep level, not the root level, not the inner level. So it's like, okay, transform me, but only take off the top, not the root. Because here's the thing, if you have a weed that like sprouts up in your backyard and you want it to like be gone, what do you do? You don't take the top off, right? You do what my dad taught me when I was a kid, when he had me do forced labor in the middle of the summer, like a day to day when it was hot outside, right? You don't take off just the top, right? You get down to the root and you pull the whole thing out. And you see, the only way that you will have transformation in your life, transformation in your marriage, transformation in how you deal with money, transformation with how you deal with your emotions, the only way that you will have true transformation is if it happens at the root level. It starts with the way you think. And so today we're continuing our series through the book of Romans. We've been going through Romans for a while now. And today we're entering into the second half of the book of Romans in Romans chapter 12. We're going to be going through Romans 12, verse 1 to 8 today. As we go through those verses, I want to talk to you from the title of Thinking That Leads to Transforming. Thinking That Leads to Transforming. This is a timely message. This is an important message because I believe that there are people listening to my voice right now that need transformation in their lives. And the only way you're going to experience that type of transformation is by having first a transformation in the way that you think. Some of you, you've been seeking transformation in your life for a while and you feel like you've been hitting a wall. You've been feeling like it's a dead end, like there's no way for you to grow. There's no way for you to get over the addiction, no way for you to get over the way that you've been living. And I want to tell you today that there is actually a possibility that you can experience transformation. But it can only happen when your mind changes, because when your mind changes, that is when your whole life can change. So let me share with you three ways that your thinking can lead to you continually transforming every day for the rest of your life. Here's the first way, is that you got to set your mind on God's mercy. Set your mind on God's mercy. Let's read verse 1 and 2 from Romans chapter 12. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, like I said in the beginning, we are now entering into the second half of the book of Romans. Really, a lot of commentators and theologians will divide Romans into these two halves. So Romans 1 to 11 is kind of more theological and talking about the mercy of God and how we are made right with God and how we are forgiven by God. And then the second half of Romans is, okay, now in light of that, this is how you should live. So here's the practical application. And as we start the second half of Romans, we see the first practical point that Paul wants to give us is that he wants us to live lives of worship. He wants our whole lives, all that we are, to be worshipful to God. Now, the opposite of worship is being conformed to the pattern of this world. And God doesn't want you and I to be conformed to the pattern of this world. He wants us to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And when you are transformed by the renewal of your mind, that is when you will be a worshiper. Now, what's the first step to having a transformed mind so that you become a life of worship. That becomes who you are. It's not just what you do, but literally your life is worship. What's the first step of thinking that leads to transforming? It's setting your mind on the mercies of God. Paul starts off the second half of this book and he says, therefore, and it's kind of a corny line, but it's like you have to ask, what's the therefore, therefore, right? Well, he's just now for the last 11 chapters 
talked about the mercy of God, the grace of God, how God forgives us and loves us. He says, therefore, in light of this, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act in worship. In other words, what he's saying is this, I want you to keep God's mercy in your view. I want you to set your mind on God's mercy, and as you set your mind on God's mercy, you'll just naturally worship Him. Here's the problem. A lot of people don't try to worship God that way. A lot of people don't try to experience transformation this way. A lot of people, this is how they view the Christian life and journey. And okay, this is how I change, and this is how I grow, and this is how I experience transformation. So God's mercy and God's grace, that's what saves me. That's what gets me into heaven. That's what makes me right with God. But then after that, it's all up to me. I got to try really, really hard to be a good person and to change and to grow. And what I'd say is this, is that is not Christianity. That's actually you falling back into man-centered religion. You see, the mercy that saves you is the mercy that changes you. God's mercy doesn't just save you so that you get into heaven. God's mercy is actually the very thing that can transform you day by day so that you become a completely different person. The person that God made you to be. A person that's more like Christ and less like your selfish or prideful desires. Now what is God's mercy? Well, we've talked a lot about it over this series, but let me just give you a reminder or a refresher. God's mercy is the fact that you do not get what you deserve. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the result is, is because of our sin, we deserve punishment, we deserve pain, we deserve separation from God, not just here on earth, but forever and eternity. But the good news of the gospel is that God is rich in mercy, and so He does not give us what we deserve. He, in His mercy, decides to withhold from us the pain and punishment that we deserve for our sin. And in fact, not just withholding from us the punishment that we deserve because of our sin, but then He richly blesses us by His grace with not just forgiveness, but a renewed relationship with Him through filling us with His Spirit and giving us a new purpose for living, a hope in heaven. This is mercy. This is grace. It's us not getting what we do deserve and also us receiving far more than we do deserve. And here's the amazing thing about God's mercy. God's mercy is not this mist that just shoots up into the air and disappears. God's mercy is this fountain that is completely flowing into your life day after day. He's rich in mercy. He gives it to us every day. The Bible says this in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 to 23. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Come on, is somebody glad today that God's mercies are new every morning? That even in the moments in your life where your sins are many, His mercies are more. Because I don't know about you, but every single day I wake up and I go throughout my day and I mess up. But every time I mess up, He has mercy for me. Because here's the incredible thing. Every day I wake up, God already knows all the stupid things I'm going to do, and He has just the amount of mercy that I need for that. Every single day you wake up, God already knows every way you're going to mess up, and He has just the amount of mercy you need. And in fact, He has even more mercy than you need. His mercies are new every morning. And here's the thing. Watch this. When you intentionally set your mind on that mercy, you will become a worshiper. It will transform you. Okay, you can think about it like this, okay? If you were an employee for this, like, big CEO, let's say uh, Elon Musk, okay, because he's kind of the most popular CEO of the day right now, and you're working for him, and, you know, you don't have a huge salary, and you have this huge debt, though, like this $10 million debt that you're never going to be able to pay back, and you're just buried in debt, and he hears about it and decides, you know what, in my grace, and out of the abundance of my riches, $10 million is nothing to me, especially when considering like the $56 billion pay package he just got this last week. I don't know if any of you heard about that. Kind of crazy. 
So in light of, you know, being the richest man in the world, basically, 10, 10 million, that's nothing. You know, I'm going to just, I'm going to pay off the debt. Now, if he did that for you as his employee, you're going to be loyal to Tesla. You're going to be loyal to Elon Musk. Like, you're never going to want to leave that company. You're going to work for him the rest of your life because you're going to be thankful to him. You're going to be grateful to him because he paid off a debt that you could never pay off yourself. And see, when you set your mind on the mercies of God, when you set your mind on the graces of God, it will make you loyal to Christ. It will make you devoted to Christ. It will make you want to serve Christ. It will make you worship Christ. And you see, this is what worship is. A lot of people think worship is just getting up, you know, on a stage or, you know, being in the stands in the church and just singing to Jesus on Sundays. Now, that's a part of worship. That is worship. You can worship God by singing praises to him. But worship is far more than that. Worship is what? It says it right here in Romans 12. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, a living sacrifice was often what they would call a burnt offering. And the burnt offerings were when the people would come and they would sacrifice their nicest, their most expensive animal that had no blemishes on it. So in other words, they would be sacrificing, they would be giving God their first and their best. That's what worship is. It's saying, God, in every single area of my life, in my marriage, and how I work, in every single area of my life, I'm worshiping you, I'm doing it with you, I'm doing it for you, I'm giving my best to you, and I'm not doing it out of obligation, but I'm doing it out of the thankfulness and gratefulness because you've saved me when I couldn't save you. Set your mind on the mercies of God and it will transform you into a worshiper. But here's the thing, watch this. You have to intentionally set your mind every morning and every night. Because here's the thing, your mind is not naturally set on God's mercies. Your mind is naturally set on your career. Your mind is naturally set on what you selfishly want. Your mind is, su- is, is, is naturally set to all other sorts of things other than the mercies of God. So every morning when you wake up, before you run into your day, before you get into your to-do list, set your mind on the mercies of God. And maybe it's just reading one verse like Lamentations and just reminding of yourself that His mercies are new every morning. Setting your mind upon the mercies of God. And here's why you have to set it, right? Because if you don't, it's going to go off the rail. If you don't set your mind, your mind will meander. Your mind will get distracted, especially with people like me when you have ADHD, right? It's just crazy. You'll just I'll squirrel. And right, we live in uh, the Bay Area right now where it's the summer. It's a, it's a little hot. So here's the thing in my house, okay? Every day, you know what I have to do? I have to set the AC so that it's at the right temperature. We got it at 72 right now. Now, you can debate me if that's too hot or too cold or whatever. In my mind, 72 is just right. That is the biblical temperature for a house, okay? I just, I think it's good. Now, if I don't set that temperature for our house, you know what's going to happen if it's just left off? Well, by 3 o'clock today, my house is going to be 85 plus degrees, and we are literally going to be dying. See, if you do not intentionally set your mind every morning and every night before you go to bed on the mercies of God, you're not going to worship. You're not going to be transformed. You're not going to be transformed. You're going to be conformed. So let me ask you a question. What is your mind set on? Is your mind set on the mercies of God or is your mind set on the problem that you're in the middle of? Set your mind on the mercies of God. That will be the start of thinking that leads to transforming. But here's the second type of thinking that can lead to transforming. It's this, is that you intentionally renew your mind. Intentionally renew your mind. Let's read verse 2 in Romans chapter 12 again. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing and perfect will. So God does not want you to be conformed. He wants you to be transformed. Now, I want you to know this. It's really easy to be conformed to the pattern of this world. You want to know why? Because the current of our culture is powerful. It's like jumping into a river with a powerful current. If you jump in, it's so easy to be swept away. And most people today in our culture are not transformed by the renewing of their mind. They're conformed to how the world thinks about sex. 
They're conformed to how the world thinks about money. They're conformed to how the world thinks about marriage. They're conformed to how the world thinks about how you should live your life. They're conformed to how they view themselves and how they view God. God does not want you to be conformed to the pattern of this world. There is a pattern to this world. And the life of a Christian is not to go along with the current of culture, but to actually swim against the current of culture. And the only way that you can do that as being by transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now here's what's really interesting. This word transformed in this passage, the Greek word that is translated into transform is actually related to our word metamorphosis. So the idea here is that this transformation, it's very much like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It's the same organism. It's the same thing, but it looks radically different. And here's what God wants to do in your life. He wants you to stay you, but He wants you to look completely different. And how does He do it? He does it by teaching you and showing you how to renew your mind. Now, what is a renewed mind? What, is it, what, is it, what does it mean to actually have a mind that has been completely renewed? It means this. It means that you begin to think in new ways. You begin to think differently about life. It means... I used to think this way about marriage, about money, about power, about my job. I used to think this way, but now God has changed my mind, and now I think a completely new way because I'm no longer conformed to how the world thinks about this. I'm now thinking the way that God wants me to think about it. So how does this happen? How do you have a renewed mind? Well, let me give you two practical steps on how you can begin to have a renewed mind. The first step is something you do, and the something is actually something that God does. So here's the first thing that you actually need to do if you want to have a renewed mind, is you need to meditate on His Word. If you want a renewed mind, it starts with meditating on His Word. Here's what the Bible says. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything according to all that is written in it. Here's this idea of meditating on God's Word. It's this, is that meditating is a lot like marinating. All right, if you ever cooked before, right, and maybe right before you put the meat on the pan or in the oven or whatever, maybe you, like, put some sauce on it real quick, maybe just a little bit of sauce and you threw it in there. Well, if you, if you cook like that, like, that could be good, and, you know, you might taste some of it in the meat, and it'll, it'll make the, you know, the dish better tasting. But if you just put on a little bit right before you put it in the pan or put it in the oven, I mean, it's, it's going to taste good, but it's not as good as if, like, the night before, you put it in, like, a little bag, and you put a bunch of sauce in it, and you let it marinate all night, and then the next morning you cooked it. Why? Because you let it sit in the sauce longer, and by doing that, it actually changed the meat completely. It's, the, it's still the meat, but it's actually, it, it's, the composition has changed. The, the look has changed. The, the taste has changed. And you see, the longer you sit in God's Word, the more it will change you. The more it will transform you. And here's the problem, is we often get little tastes and little glimpses of God's Word into our life, but very rarely, because of the busyness and the fast pace of the world that we live in, very rarely do we actually just, like, I'm going to sit in God's Word right now. And I'm just going to take one verse, and I'm going to take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and I'm just going to think about it. And I'm just going to soak in God's Word. See, I'm glad that you're here this Sunday. Like, come every Sunday. We love you. You belong here. And, like, I want to share God's Word with you so that you can be encouraged and you can go into your week filled up. And, okay, God loves me. He has a plan for me. Let's do it. Let's go. But if this is all you get... You're not really marinating in God's Word. You're just kind of getting a little sprinkle of God's Word once a week. And that's good. It's better than nothing. But God has so much more for you. And as you meditate on God's Word, here's the incredible thing that happens. The more you meditate on God's Word, what you'll see is that God's Word, it's like this multifaceted diamond. That you can look at it from all these different angles and see all these different parts about God's Word and how, oh my gosh, like, yeah, this is what it means but like it means this for my marriage and it means this for my business and it means this for my sexuality and it means this for like all, and you go into all these different areas in your life like wow, God's word applies to literally so many different areas of my life and the more you meditate on it, the more you realize 
how that one verse applies to literally not just one area, but several areas of your life. But the only way that that can happen, the only way that you can have that renewed mind is you have to take the time to meditate on His Word day and night. The psalmist says in Psalm chapter 1 that you become, when you meditate on His Word day and night, like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, which leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. So if you want a renewed mind, it starts with meditating on God's Word. But here's the other thing that God does, and you participate with Him, is that you've got to listen to the Spirit speaking. You've got to listen to the Spirit speaking. John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says, But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything, and He will remind you of everything I've told you. Now this is right before, Jesus is speaking, right before He's to be crucified, resurrected and then 40 days later after his resurrection ascend into heaven so this is before all that and jesus is telling his disciples his inner group of followers he's saying listen guys there's going to be a time where i'm going to go back to the father i'm going to go back to heaven but don't worry i'm not going to leave you as orphans i'm going to send my spirit to you and what he's going to do is the spirit's going to speak to you and he's going to remind you of everything that i've already said Here's the good news of the gospel. When you place your faith in Jesus, you're not just forgiven of your sins. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer is He reminds you of God's Word so that you are transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now some people say, well, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Well, my question to you is, does it align with God's Word? Because if you say the Spirit spoke to you and it doesn't align with God's Word, that's from a Spirit, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. That's a demonic Spirit, or it's just you thinking that your voice is God's voice. It isn't. So the Holy Spirit will never conflict with the Holy Scriptures. And so the way that you know it's God's voice is, is it in alignment with God's Word? And you see, you don't even know if the Holy Spirit is reminding you of something if you haven't gotten into the Word yourself. How can the Holy Spirit remind you of something you've never even known? You can't remember something that you never knew in the first place. And so it starts with reading God's Word. It starts with studying God's Word. It starts with meditating on God's Word. And as you do that, the Holy Spirit says, Okay, now we got some ammunition. Now we got this stockpile that I can draw from and I can remind you. It's like, you know, I'm in the middle of a conversation with my wife and maybe we start an argument, which, you know, that never happens, by the way. And uh, we get in an argument, maybe we get in a disagreement, and there comes this moment where she says something or does something that really annoys me, that really bothers me, and I'm about to lash out on her, I'm about to get angry at her, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit swoops in. Reminds me of Ephesians chapter 4, don't let anything come out of your mouth unless it is to build the other person up. Dang it, I can't say that to her anymore really wanted to get back. It was going to be a really good comeback line. But the Holy Spirit reminds us. And here's the thing, right? Sometimes the Holy Spirit reminds us. I'm like, no, blocked. All right, I, want, I, want, I want to do what I'm going to do anyways. I'm going to say what I'm going to say anyways. I'm not going to listen to the Holy Spirit's promptings and guidings. But see, the key is, is meditating on God's Word so that it can renew our mind. And then as we do that, what the Holy Spirit does by His grace, because He loves us and He fills us if we placed our faith in Jesus is he reminds us of God's word to guide us. And here's what's incredible. Watch this. This is really important. As you intentionally renew your mind through the spirit of God and through the word of God, here's the promise that we see here in, cha in uh, chapter 12, verse 2. He says, as you are transformed by the renewal of your mind, then what? You will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, perfect will is. I want you to know this if you didn't know already. God has a perfect plan for your life. Now, let's be clear here. Let's not confuse our plan with God's plan. I've done this so many times in my life. Confusing my plan with God's plan. You know what the key is to discovering God's will for your life? You know what the key is? Because a lot of people, like as a pastor, they come up to me. How do I know God's plan for my life? How do I know God's will for my life? How should I know, you know, what decision I should make? You know, who I should marry? What college I should go to? Like, whatever it is, right? Well, the Bible actually says it right here. If you want to be able to test and approve what God's perfect will is for your life, it starts with having a renewed mind. Now, this is so counterintuitive because what do most people ask for when they're making the decision and trying to discern God's will? They ask for two things in the Christian culture. 
Uh, number one, Lord, give me a sign. And I've done this before. And by the way, there's actually nothing wrong with this. I've actually prayed for signs and God's actually given me signs. That's happened before. But that's not how God ordinarily operates. Or we say, Lord, you know, give me peace about the decision. You know what's really interesting? I did a research on this. There is not a single verse in all of Scripture that says that God will give you peace when you're making a decision. Now, the Bible says that God wants to give you peace in general as a believer. So God always wants to give you peace regardless of your circumstances. But in fact, what you'll see in Scripture is oftentimes when God has you make decisions, sometimes He's causing you to step out in faith, and sometimes that can cause you to not have peace. Because you're like, oh, I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. And so what the Bible actually says, ordinarily, the way that God wants us to operate if we want to discover His will for our life is what? It's not through signs, although sometimes He'll give us signs. It's not through, like, a subjective sense of peace, although He does want us to have peace. The way that He helps us to discern His will for our lives is not just by showing us, because if He did that, we'd never grow in maturity and wisdom. What He wants us to do is He wants us to grow to the place where our mind has been transformed by His Word, and we become so familiar with His Word, and we become so familiar with His ways, and we become so familiar with the Holy Spirit's voice in our life, that we become mature to the point where we have the discernment and the wisdom to test and approve what His will is for our lives. Listen, if I always gave, like my daughters are young, right? And as they grow up, if I just always give everything to them on a platter and never let them figure it out themselves, they're never going to grow. Now, sometimes God, like I said, He'll give you the sign. He'll give you whatever out of His grace. But what God wants you to do is He wants you to grow into maturity. He wants you to have your mind transformed by His Word and by His Spirit so that when you're making big decisions in your life, you're able to test and approve what His will is. That's the type of thinking that leads to transforming. But then here's the third one. This one's really key. The third type of thinking that leads to transforming is you think of yourself realistically. You think of yourself realistically. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 8. It says this, For the, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your grace is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So here's the thing. You might have missed it in the first verse. But God wants you to think of yourself. Did you know that? I thought, that doesn't sound Christian. I need to deny myself. Pick up my cross. Follow him. Follow Jesus. Yes, that's true. But did you know that God wants you to think of yourself? If you don't think of yourself, you know what you become? You become an unaware person. There are a lot of Christians, oh my gosh, I hate to say this. There are so many Christians that like lack like any self-awareness. It's insane. Did you know that you could be saved and completely not self-aware? It's possible. You could be saved and going into heaven and be the most unself-aware person in the whole world. So that's why Paul, he's writing to these Christians after he's already shared about salvation and how to be saved. Now he's focusing on practical application and maturity. He's saying, listen guys, I want you to think of yourselves, but watch this. I don't want you to think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Rather, I want you to think of yourself soberly. Here's the big idea. God doesn't want you to think too high of yourself. God doesn't also want you to think too low of yourself. God wants you to think of yourself realistically. That's the whole idea of being sober-minded and thinking of yourself soberly. Now, here's the problem. is a lot of people think that it's really Christian to think really low of themselves. It's like this false humility. Oh, I'm no good. You know, God can never use me. I'm a bag of dirt. You know, I'm a sinner and uh, all this stuff. That's actually false humility. And actually, 
that's telling God he's a liar because God says that you're made in his image and that you're worth dying for. So you don't want to think too low of yourself because here's the thing, if you think too low of yourself, well then God can never really use you. Because you just think you're damaged goods and you know, you're not good enough and you'll never measure up. And so you're just going to live a very complacent life that's not really going to do a lot for God and others. But here's the other problem. If you think too high of yourself, here's the problem. You're going to think that you have more gifts than you really have. And you're going to think you're good at things that you're not good at. You're going to think that you can do things that you cannot do. And so you're not going to live a fruitful and effective life because you're going to spend your time going in directions that you shouldn't be going, doing things that you should not be doing. And so the big idea here that Paul's saying is Paul's saying, listen, by God's grace, when we're saved, not only does he lock up a place for us in heaven, reserved a room for us in heaven, but here on earth he's filled us with his spirit and by filling us with his spirit he's given us spiritual gifts and those gifts are meant to be used for service to God and service to others and those gifts are meant to be an instrument that God plays to make beautiful music in the world so that other people can be impacted. And the problem is when you see yourself too high or you see yourself too low, you actually handicap yourself from being able to be used by God and those gifts that he's given you. You know, and what's really cool is a little infomercial here in the middle of the sermon. Earlier during the announcements, I was talking about our Connect class that is today, right after our worship gathering is over at Paxi's Pizza. And if you've never taken that class before, I encourage you to take the class. And a part of what that class does is it helps you discover your gifts and help you see yourself more realistically so that you can use your gifts for God and for others. But here's what's really interesting. You know, some of you know this about me already, and some of you don't. Uh, before I was a pastor, one of the things I, I thought I was going to do with my life is that I really wanted to be a football coach. Like, that was my dream. I, I loved it. And when I was in college, I coached football for the, uh, three years, and it was incredible, and I loved it. And it was so funny. Every year we had, you know, a new team, new players, and every year I always had two different types of players. There was the one type of player, you know, everybody wants to be like the quarterback. Because the quarterback is like, you know, you get your Letterman jacket and you get to brag to everybody that you're the quarterback. And, you know, an immature teenage boy is like, how could I get a girl? Oh, I want to be a quarterback. So every season, without fail, I'd have a line of like at least half a dozen players saying, oh, coach, I'll, I could throw really well. I want to be the quarterback. And there'd be sometimes where I was like, dude, uh, you're 275 pounds. You can't be the quarterback, but you know what? You can block for the quarterback. And I'd have these players that want to be in positions that they had no business being in because they were unaware of their gifts and they thought of themselves more highly than they were. Now, the thing was, is it's not that they didn't have gifts. It's that they thought they had a gift that they didn't have when really they had a better place that they could be using their gifts. And that's what this passage is saying is that we're a body. We're all many members, right? Like one's an arm, one's a leg, one's a mouth, one's like the hair, one's like the, the spleen. And here's the thing. I'll just say this about spiritual gifts. Visibility does not equal importance. Like, you can't see my liver right now, but um, if I didn't have it, I'd die. So just because your use of the gift that God has given you isn't prominent, like you're not on a stage like I am right now, doesn't mean you're less important than what I'm doing. What you're doing might even be more important than what I'm doing. Prominence does not equal, prominence and popularity does not equal significance. Did you watch that? Prominence does not equal significance. Every gift that God gives matters, but you see, you don't want to think of yourself more highly than you ought, because if you do that, it's like, well, if I put that 275-pound kid in at quarterback and he's our starting quarterback, we're not going to win any if, like, like we're not going to win a lot of games. That's not his gift. Like, he needs to be on the front line blocking for the quarterback. He's a big dude. He could block the other big guys that are trying to hit the quarterback. But then I'd have these other group of players, right, where they were really talented and they were in the right position that they should have been in and they accepted that, but they really lacked confidence. And when the game started, they'd be like, oh, man, like the game's on the line I'm, I don't know if I make a mistake what if I forget the play what if I do this or that so what I'd have to do with the really like players that thought they should be in a position they weren't I'd be like no you shouldn't be in that position you should be in this position but with the players that were really nervous and like they had the talent and they had the gifts and they were in the right position but they just they, they had the nerves they didn't have the confidence for them I'd be like hey no like you can do this like you're amazing like you have these gifts like keep going like keep trying like we're here for you you can do it you're awesome 
And so sometimes God has to humble us and sometimes God has to build us up depending on how we see ourselves. And some of you, you see yourself too highly than you should and God actually is having to humble you so that you can do what you're supposed to do. Others of you are so like lowly of yourselves and you don't see anything good about who you are and God actually needs to build you up and say, no, like this is the gift I've given you. Like it's amazing and like I want to use you and like get into the game. Stop staying on the sidelines. Like, get in the game. I want to use you to advance my kingdom. Because you are good enough, not because of who you are, but because of who I am and what I've done for you and what I've imparted into you. You see, the same grace that saves you is the same grace that gives you gifts. You don't earn your spiritual gifts. And, I mean, this is really the problem, is a lot of people start to think that they're awesome because of the gifts that God gave them. I see this all the time with preachers. I see this in my life. It can be so easy for somebody to be a really good speaker. And this is why a lot of pastors fall, by the way, especially the really gifted pastors. I mean, just this last few weeks, we had a few really popular pastors, pastor of a 100,000 person church, pastor of a 20,000 person church. Boom, moral failure, fallen. It happens all the time. Why? Well, every situation is different, but I'll say this, I think a really big part of it is people start to see the fruit of their gifts and they start to see God moving in their life and in the lives of others and like, oh yeah. And then they start to think, oh, I'm awesome. Look at how cool I am. Like when I speak, people listen. When I speak, people's lives are changed. It's like, well, yeah, but guess what? That's because of the gift that God gave you, not because of you. And what can be really easy, like what can happen in our lives is we could start to pretend like the gifts that God have get, has given us is something that we earn, something that we, we manufactured, and it isn't. It's like it wouldn't make any sense if somebody gave me a brand new, like, Tesla as a gift. It wouldn't make any sense for me to be all pri proud about that and to be prideful and be like, look how awesome I am. I got this brand new Tesla. It's like, no, dude, you shouldn't be prideful. You should be thankful. This dude just gave you this gift. You could drive it. You could have a good time with it, but don't act like you earned it. See, God doesn't just, by His grace, give you salvation. By His grace, He gives you gifts. And those gifts shouldn't puff us up with pride. Those gifts, we should humble ourselves before God and say, Oh, God, thank you that you've given me the gift of administration. Thank you that you've given me the gift of generosity. Thank you that you've given me the gift of mercy. Thank, whatever gift it is that you have. If you're a believer, you have a gift. Begin to change the way you think about it. Don't see yourself too highly. Don't think of yourself lowly think of yourself realistically realize that God gives you the gifts so that you could serve him and serve others not serve yourself and as you change your thinking and how you think of yourself that type of thinking will lead to a transforming and as we've today talked about this idea of thinking that leads to transforming I just got to ask you today this really important question it's this is your thinking conforming to the pattern of this world or is your thinking being transformed by God's word and God's spirit. Because here's the deal. It's one of the two. Your thinking is always being transformed by God's word and God's spirit, or your thinking is always being conformed to the pattern of this world. So my question to you is, is your mind filled with lustful thoughts, prideful thoughts, fearful thoughts? Or is your mind filled with thoughts that come from God's word and God's spirit? Remember, actions always come from thoughts the root is what causes the fruit. What's the fruit of your life? I can tell you right now that's a reflection of your thought life. Today, you don't need to be conformed to the pattern of this world. Today, you don't need to be dominated by anxiety. You don't need to be dominated by lust. You don't need to be dominated by grief. You don't need to be dominated by alcoholism. You don't need to be dominated by whatever it is. God today can give you true transformation if you come to Him and you come to Him by faith and you say, Lord Jesus, I'm asking today that you would renew my mind. Set your mind on the mercies of God. And as you set your mind on His mercy, you will worship Him and He will transform you. Let's pray. And in this moment, I just want to pray a prayer of transformation. A prayer of asking God to change my mind. And if you want to join me in this time, maybe it's asking God to transform you for the first time. 
Or maybe it's just asking God to transform you more and more. And the thing about being a follower of Jesus is it's a, a life of continual transformation. We're not a finished product. We're continually being transformed day after day. You could pray this prayer of transformation along with me. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for the fact that my mind and my life has often been conformed to the pattern of this world. But Lord, today I'm asking that you would transform me by the renewing of my mind. Lord Jesus, thank you that your mercy does not just save me, but it changes me too. From this day forward, Lord, I ask that you would help me by your grace to set my mind on your mercies and your word and your spirit so that I may not just test and approve what your will is, but Lord, that it, so that I could live it out. In Christ's name. Everybody said? Amen. Well, hey, remember when we set our mind upon the mercies of God, naturally it should cause worship. So let's stand together and worship Him in this time. so far gone But you came crashing in with a love so strong I never thought I would ever feel it But your love gave me all that I needed This heart of mine This heart of mine was so far gone you came crashing in with a love so strong I never thought I would ever feel it But your love gave me all that I needed I'm in love, I love I'm in love How can I remember what I was doing before I met you? I've been captivated This love you gave me This heart of mine Is so far gone But you came crashing here With a love so strong I never thought I would ever feel it But your love gave me all that I needed And I'm in love, I can not remember what I was doing before I met you I've been captivated, Lord, by this love you gave me I'm in love, I can not remember what I was doing before I met you been captivated by the love you gave me. You saved me, you saved me. I won't ever leave your love. No. You saved me, you saved me. I won't ever leave
been captivated, Lord, by this love you gave me. You saved me, you saved me. I won't ever leave you alone. Thank you, thank you. You saved me, you saved me. I won't ever leave you alone. Shout a praise, church. He saved you. He's on your Man. side. Love. Hey, so good to spend this Sunday with you all. Love you all so very much. A few things before we head out today. Uh, first, if you're new with us, maybe it's your first or second time with us, uh, before you head out, please stop by our Connect Center, which is to the left of the exit. we got a table there. We'd love to just meet you, say hello to you, and we have a gift for you as a way of just saying thanks for being with us. And then, like I said earlier, we do have that Connect class today. Uh, it's going to start in like 10 minutes at Paxi's Pizza uh, right across the way here. And we're going to reserve a table uh, out there on the deck. Or actually, it's hot outside. We'll probably be inside. Uh, cancel that. We'll be inside with the air conditioning. But if you've never taken that class, seriously, uh, attend it. We'd love to have you there. Uh, and I'll be at the Connect Center. So if you want to go and uh, you're going, like, let me know so I know how many pizzas to order. But uh, anyways... Have a great week. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week as we continue through the book of Romans. Excited for the second half of Romans 12. It's going to be great. See you then.